Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Dr. Ryan, and it must be Tuesday at 5 o'clock because uh, I'm here and you are too, and we're getting ready to do our weekly broadcast. I'm really excited today. Uh, coming on the show, I got one of my brothers in broadcasting and one of his good friends. Uh, you know, I've been trying to get Reuben on the show. Uh, they call this, um, you know, uh, uh, Black History Month. And it's impossible to do anything around black history without getting one of the uh, historians of the city of Chicago and across the country on the show. So I got Mr. Reuben Fellows coming on in a little bit on the show. And he's bringing in one of his good friends, uh, Mr. David Peterson, who is the uh, director of the, uh, the Pullman Porter Museum that's going on in Chicago. So I'm really excited about bringing them on the show. Uh, but before we get to them, you know, I always got to have uh, some updates and talk about some things that's going on uh, all over the news and all over the Internet right now. They're talking about the uh, uh, the latest Trump escapade. Uh, Trump just signed a piece of paper to free the former governor of the state of Illinois, Blago, as we call him. Uh, he's getting free. And, uh, and and from what I understand, 11 other people are getting free as well. Um, but I got to go there. You know, I know I don't normally go there, but uh, I will say that they all white. You know, during Black History Month, he ain't freed nobody black. He freed all white people. So y'all just marinate on that one for a minute. You know, and the first thing he said when he did it was that... Um, uh, uh, that, that, that the former governor was a Democrat, like it makes a difference, you know, like, oh yeah, I freed a Democrat, you know, so like he was going to get a whole lot of, you know, support and brownie points for letting this man go. Uh, and everybody in the state of Illinois, in the city of Chicago and in Springfield were opposed to them, uh, releasing this man early. Uh, they felt like justice was served and that he was doing time, uh, the right amount of time. You know, Supreme Court in Illinois said, oh yeah, he got the right amount of time. Uh, but yet, you know, like I said in the beginning of the show, escapade of, Don, uh, uh, of our current tr uh, President Trump is saying that, you know, oh man, he got too much time and everything was unjustified and everything was all wrong. But uh, he going he going home pretty soon. As soon as they can get the paperwork together, they're gonna definitely be sending him home to his family. You know, now we got other families that uh, are missing their head of their household, but that ain't important right now. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. That's all over the news today. They've been talking about it uh, all afternoon, all morning when the news broke. Uh, you know, I will say that. Uh, his his um, uh, his wife did the right thing. She she petitioned Trump on Fox News, so maybe that's a, a something that if you've got a loved one that's in the same situation, maybe you need to go on Fox News and petition the president for help. All right. Uh, also talking about the All Star Weekend that was successfully completed. Uh, in Chicago. Now, I know uh, my good friend Reeves going to have some things to say about the All-Star Weekend because he would not be Reeves if he don't. Um, but I will say that they reported several things. Um, they had several events going on all across the, you know, the city of Chicago. Some were without violence. Some were with some trouble. Uh, it was interesting. I noticed that at one of the events, every coat was stolen. I don't know who stole everybody's coat, but every coat, when people got ready to leave the party, all the coats was missing. That's some cold-blooded stuff, especially in Chicago, as cold as it is. Uh, also, they had a fight, a couple of fights break out at different clubs with some of the DJs that was going on. Uh, as far as they reported, nobody was hurt. Uh, you know, probably some gang stuff. You know, they always blame everything on gang stuff. But that's probably some of the stuff that happened. Now, I actually attended a uh, all-star event uh, with Chef Carlton. He was on the show last week. We talked about it. 
uh, actually went to the event and it turned out to be very peaceful uh, nothing but grown folks there it was a very nice event it turned out real good uh, my hat goes off to Chef Carlton on 79th Street he had a successful event and um, and then the very next day he went to the hospital so y'all pray for the brother because he ain't feeling too good right now his blood pressure went up and ain't came back down yet I checked on him earlier today and uh, he definitely is still in the hospital. So I wanted to touch bases with him uh, to see how he was doing, see if he was getting well, uh, if he was getting any better. Uh, Soul Street Collective got their anniversary event coming up uh, on uh, March the 14th at uh, the entrance in Harvey. You don't want to miss that. Tables are going fast. So you might want to uh, scroll down on my feed here and you'll actually see a plugger. Click on the plugger, get the information and tell them how many tables you want to get from Eventbrite. So um, I'm trying to speed through some of these things here so I can get to my guest today. Uh, let me go over here and bring up my website. Let's do that. Um, I want you to go over to ask-dr-ron.com. That's askdrron.com. When you get over there, I want you to pay attention to all the things that I got going on on my website. You'll see my time slot for the talk show every Tuesday from 5 to 6. You'll see some very important information about me on there, people that I'm affiliated with, uh, sponsors and advertisers. Uh, my former co-host, Miss Opal Staples, she's got a video there. Soul Street Collective, the group I just talked to you about. Uh, their information is currently here if you're interested in booking them for uh, an upcoming event. Their number's right there. You can reach out to them. And then you run across some of my favorite advertisers. And the first one on here is Port Again Sam. Port Again Sam has been with me for over 10 years. That brother has been with me for a very long time. And I tell you, he brings in some of the best wine from all over the world wines and spirits and and i tell you you can't get them anyplace else but from sam if you click on the banner it'll take you right to his website and you'll be able to contact him and and ask him to set up a wine tasting and you'll get a chance to find some of the best wine whatever you like whatever you think you like you know he will find your palate and help you pick the right wine. I tell you, Sam has nothing but the best. And it's exclusive. When he runs out, he runs out. I tell you, you will never find it again once Sam says it's gone. Now, they may come out with a different vintage or a different year. But that one, oh man, why you better get it while he got it. That's all I can say. Uh, also on here, I have National Block Club University. Uh, I've been working with uh, Mr. Cyron Smith for many years now. Uh, he is on the front line of your neighborhoods and your communities all across the country and across the world trying to bring a change. You know, it's difficult enough, you know, that we have so many people that talk about change, but he's on the front line trying to bring a change. Click on the banner, go over to his website, contact him or his organization and they will be more than happy to tell you how you can participate and help bring in a change to your block, to your neighborhood, to your schools. That's what he is all about, trying to bring a change. Also, you'll find Chief Nomo. Chief Nomo has been advertising with me since last year, South Side of Chicago. Um, I know this is uh, Black History Month, and I just don't like to limit it to just one month. I like to limit it to every month, all 12 months in the year. And they promote by black. We've been promoting by black. If you don't know a black business, you know several dealing with me. You got Port Again Sam and Chief Nomo. Chief Nomo is definitely a black business. He brings in products, goods, and services from the continent of Africa. So he's got alkaline water and moringa seeds. Uh, he can help you. Uh, with your new year resolution about having better health so chief nomo is definitely a person that you want to reach out to and tell him you heard about it here on the ask dr ron show 
And last but not least, my brother that I've been working with for over 10 years also, RRJ Web. If you do not have a website and you need a website, reach out to RRJ Web, send him an email, reach out to him, and he will be more than happy to sit down and help you get your uh, your web address. He'll help you build your website, and he also does maintenance. So you definitely want to talk to him about getting on one of his programs. He has programs for every every price category that you can imagine. So there's no budget too big or too small. He will work with you. That's all he does is websites. He don't do websites and other stuff. That's all he does. R R J Web. Uh, and he also hosts my website, that's ask-dr-ron.com, and he can help build what you need for your web solutions, all right? All right, so now I'm going to play my theme song here, so y'all hold on one second. theme song uh, performed by Miss Tiffany Roberts uh, all the way from the city of Atlanta. Uh, she put that together for me over 10 years ago and I tell you it's still relevant today. I love it. You know if you listen to it enough times you'll start singing it for yourself. So when you get over to my website ask-dr-rn.com I want you to go over to the contact page, uh, fill out your information, uh, let us know if you're interested and you want to be an advertiser. If you want to be a part of what we got going on over here at the Ask Dr. Ron Show, just let me know. And I'll be more than happy to talk to you. And we can set up an advertisement program for you where we can bring you on the show, uh, talk to what you got going on, put links on here so that you can be found through the people that know me. Also, you will find a, a uh, navigational tab on here about cash crowdfunding. Now, you know y'all spend enough money over the All-Star Weekend where you need to make some of that money back. Uh, if you click on that informational tab, it'll explain to you what cash crowdfunding is. And, and you can learn on how you can be a part of cash crowdfunding. Cash crowdfunding is putting money back in your pocket and it's real easy to do. The details are there and we'll be more than happy to help you get signed up and help you get started. All right, I'm excited to move forward. Uh, right now, we're going to go over to my brother in broadcasting and in media, Mr. Reven Fellows and Mr. David Peterson. How you brothers doing? Oh, good, good. Man, I'm Black Nificent. Black Nificent. Now, the one with that yellow thing on his jacket, that's Reven. And then the one with the skull cap, that's David. So I just want my guests to know who you are. So now Reven has been with me on the air before. And uh, uh, I'm going to give a, a disclaimer right now. You know, uh, the Ask Dr. Ryan show is not responsible for the things that may come out of Reven Fellow's mouth. Okay. Now he's been listening to the show up until this point in time. So I know he got some things to say about black history, the governor. And any, anything else that I didn't talk about, the the, 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 the All-Star Weekend and the coats that the people stole. I know you got something to say, Reven. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm honored to be on the show, first of all, and be here with one of the young brothers I've been mentoring, Mr. David Peterson of the National A. Philip Randolph. 
and it's fit that you would bring me here as a historian and being with the historical first black labor union museum director one of the youngest directors of all to be able to do that brother david but yeah man i'm honored to be on your show as usual and uh you know i always got something to say but uh i want to do a point of correction with donald trump mm -hmm. um he freeing the governor but the first person he freed uh if you remember the nfl football game that was in black history month with a black quarterback I watched that whole show and it was virtually about the Latino community. This is not anti-Latino, but they did the whole show, J Lo and them. They did their program. They had some script poles up there too. But at the other end of it, a black quarterback, a lot of brothers in the league, they did not recognize Black Country Month, but very mild. I may have missed it. But I do know I recall number forty five felt um felt uh, I guess motivated. And maybe because he elected, but at the end of the day the young lady that called Obama and Michelle while she was in prison uh, doing time to see if she can get some help. They would not return her call. And then, you know, Kanye's wife, who knew Trump's wife, um, reached out to her on behalf of the young lady, and Trump uh, freed her. So the Black History commercial for the football game seemed like she said, Trump let me go and got me free and reconnect the family. So the moral of that story was reconnecting families. Donald Trump, a black lady, from the prison get back with family and now she has the governor so that's part two so he's doing it black and white well <laughs> so let, 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 let me just ask you a question okay that was one black lady right yes sir he let 12 white people go today right that's right okay yeah, that's yeah. all that's all the question i want to ask okay right. <laughs> you want to know that i i, I want to say that the, uh, and this is not about pumping Trump up, but I do know that he signed the partner for uh, Jack Johnson. Uh, that he signed a partner. He's black. He actually signed a, uh, the bill recognizing the United States government last year for uh, for uh, slavery uh, inflicted on us the people. He signed that bill last year. And he's also the, the Opportunity Zone. As you know, they're stealing all our tip money in Illinois, but the Opportunity Zone came from 45. And 45 say, if you're in a disadvantaged community and you're not getting funding, I'm sure Brother David can talk about it next level, but that money is coming from Donald Trump to Chicago for disadvantaged communities for black people to get a part of the redevelopment. And so that's one more. I got one more I can't think of now, but I do know that those three things, not just, let's say, he's done some things black, and I think, I, I think it's powerful to put Kanye West, whether we like it or not, uh, and not in a back room meeting, and get on there and Kanye and say, free Larry Hoover, I want reparations, I want jobs, I want everything in an open forum and for black people. So I don't get along with 45, but I do know that fight could come out your, your check. And if he get that federal money, we need it down here in the shack. <laughs> but, but see, all those things that you mentioned that he did, have, have we been able to take advantage of it? Because, I mean, all I've heard is a press conference. I ain't seen nothing else other than a press conference. Well, if I may, if I may interject, you know, that's that's the problem right there. I'm glad that you said it in that manner, you know. Have we been able to utilize it? But that's a matter of what are we willing to do individually? You know what I mean? I think that what happens is we give elected officials too much power. You know, they are there to do a job of representing that republic and that government, if you will, right? It's our duty as constituents to engage them properly and force their hand. You know, that's what the what, what Harold Washington say, you know, make me do it. Y'all got to come in here and make me do it. You know what I mean? So that's what we have to do. But unfortunately, we, we're not really in that space. Mentally, we've been used as puppets emotionally. So everybody would rather talk about why they don't like somebody as opposed to what can I force this person to do? You know, hey, Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1941 went to President Roosevelt and said, if you don't do this, we're going to march on Washington. The result was him signing Executive Order 8802, which banned all discriminatory practices in the armed forces and work-related fields. So I say all that to say, if we don't galvanize our people as a voting bloc, uh, as, as a, a voting um, body politic, then we can't expect someone to, we can't expect someone to just do it for us. Sorry. You know, and I think, I think that that's, I think that's very, because 
Yeah, that, okay, now we there. Y'all there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're here. We're here. All right, you got to hit the video button again. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Did you hear it? Okay, there yeah. you go. There you I, go. I think that's I think that's important because once once again, we're about to miss the opportunity. You know what I mean? To really, really elevate ourselves to a regal existence by by um by doing too much emotional people please. You know what I mean? This is the time where we need to be getting everything out of this government that we can because the difference between the Democratic machine and the Republican machine is the Republican machine is more uh, is a is a better environment for us to create businesses, if you will. You know what I mean? Less taxes, less government involvement. It's more about people that are trying to you know make some money independently. Whereas in the other one, we're gonna get what we've been getting, and unfortunately that that's been going on under Democratic Black rule. So in all of these communities and all of these wards in, in the city of Chicago, we have never at any point in time had as much black leadership as we have right now. There's absolutely no reason for all practical purposes that we have the disinvestment that we have in our city. Now, I applaud Lori Lightfoot for the, 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 the new strides that she's trying to do with the Invest Southwest, uh, the, the neighborhood opportunity funds. You know, we, we appreciate those things, but they have to materialize first though. And what he was saying about the opportunity zones, we're in a space where in these blighted communities, we can make people can make high level investments and not have to pay a capital gains tax for seven to 10 years. So that's increasing the amount of high level investments that we have coming into our communities because there's an incentive on the back end. But we're not crafting it quick enough in order to take advantage of it. So we need to we need to we need to get to the beat, you know, because I mean, you know, I mean, even even, even the conversation about Blago, you know, I personally know ex felons that he's impacted tremendously. Because when I first got back to Chicago from uh, Florida, when I went to school in Florida A&M in, in 2007, I was a part of a collective down here in the Grand Boulevard area where we put uh, we helped Dr. Carol Adams put together what they call the safety networks, and that was um, that was the, you know the violence interruption and all of that type of stuff, right? And what we were doing was you know using ex felons and, and and you know disenfranchised people in order to change our communities. So under that administration, that was one of the only administrations that gave an ex-felon a contract to run an ex-offender reentry uh, program, which was one of my mentors, was the late great Joseph Watkins. So I had, I was blessed with the opportunity to see a lot of that stuff firsthand, and I also know about a conversation that he personally had with Joseph Watkins, where he told Joseph Watkins, "You know what? I wanted to fund you guys, but the black people were telling me not. To, the black people who were in charge told me not to give you all no money." Mm -hmm. Because you all were you all were nothing but some ex felons. If I can add, um, Brother David, well put. Uh, before the last election, there was fifty nine black elected officials in Illinois, the largest in the United States. After the election, there's eighty nine black elected officials, the largest in the United States. Two term president, first black uh, congressman another black congressman and blacks all over chicago every national black leader in illinois every national black organization and every black uh baptist pentecostal leader from all over the country but i say that to say the largest concentration of black people in the united states reside on the west and south side of chicago what made me almost cry uh they brought uh mayor lori lightfoot brought a brother from detroit to come here who was uh, with economic development, he's heading up, his name is Maurice Cox. I sat in a meeting on the west side and watched him come with a whole team of planning, department of planning, mayor sent to a community meeting that we were talking about, nothing but blah, blah. And he put up on the billboard a PowerPoint that said that in his research coming here to Chicago, he's walked through the black community, he's been on, but he did the data and he said to us in that meeting with the map color that for 50 years blacks have been in disinvested in chicago illinois that means with an eight-year prison all the black leadership we have congressman danny davis over appropriation we had jesse jackson jr so i'm saying this is not a pump trump but if you look at our community it's embarrassing. It's an indictment to say that we haven't got nothing between Harold Washington from the 60s to now. 50 years of disinvestment is criminal and somebody should be going to jail. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, you know, th th those positions are there for us to become best friends and have a milk and cookie party with them people. You know what I mean? We not we don't know the we don't know these people, these elected officials. You know, they're there to do a job that we force them to do. You know, it's our it's our duty as as uh, black people and, and, and fighting for our liberation in this country to have our agenda set to the point where if the person's black, white, purple, dotted, and spotted in office, we take it to them and say, look, this is what you got to sign on to. These are our demands. This is what we want. Just like every other group does, just like the LGBT do, just like the Hispanics do, just like everybody else is doing and been successful in doing, based off our roadmap that we <laughs> put together in, in the 40s, in the 20s, in the 30s, and in the 60s. That's all. That's all. That's all regurgitation of what was done, very frankly, by who we're talking about, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the very first Black Union to receive a charter on the American Federation of Labor. So we got to use our organizing power to our advantage. Now, let me ask you a question. I saw that um, that there is an event coming up at the uh, uh, Chicago State University, I believe it is, where they're going to have the, the National Agenda meeting again. Now, they do this every year. And people walk out of that meeting, and it's a hoopla session or rah, 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 let's do this, let's do that. And then they don't do nothing until the next time they have a meeting. So, you know, uh, and I'm not trying to put down the event uh, or indict the people that's involved, but, you know, uh, and I can even go back even further. You know, you go to the Million Man March, you know, people left out of Washington, D.C., empowered to go back to their communities to do things. And then when they mm -hmm. got there, it was only a handful of people that received them and accepted the work that they had done and even acknowledged it. You know, because right. there was some work done, but it's not being acknowledged. So, you know, I put the question to you two guys because y'all seem like y'all got y'all black power thing on together. You know, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, you know. Well, well, you strong. The unique thing about that, Doctor Ron, that's been the difference: elder and young man. Right. See, that's the difference. That's the difference from this conversation. You've been my mentor. Now we, you got some fruit out there, I know, and this has been the fruit of coming back home to the community, and you can see his articulation from the streets to the suites. But this is what we fail; we are not passing the thing. So let me go into the difference between this Black Agenda Conference than the others. Well, one of them is Reven Fellows is one of the coordinator boots on the ground has been organized, and I've looked at every Black Agenda since the 1800s to now. And so what we've done over the years put together a group of people to do the research data so those plans don't stay on the table. So I've been able to work with Brother David. He's the next generation. He's been dissecting from his generation on where we may have failed in, in, with the new technology and bringing it down to, as you see, his target articulation. But what even makes it even more, the guy that's calling the meeting, uh, State Rep LaShawn K. Ford and, and Rep. Smith, is Rep. Ford has been unapologetically black writing policies to deal with black agendas. So what we're going to do, I'm going to get all the boots on the ground and we're going to bring them to Chicago State. But what we're going to do that's different is we're going to use Chicago State Institution to be a place like the University of Chicago. So we got research, redevelopment, data, and we're looking at funding to come back to fund these propaganda, these uh, economic development plans. So I'm not going to have a meeting on what we met on. I'm going to have a meeting and I'm going to bring these young people to the table and bring them to the level up and vote. Brother David has a coalition, he's moving. So I want to put these young people in a position that we can get out their way, quit driving the keys with your granddaddy self and your grandmama, let your children take the stern wheel and move for expedition. So Dr. Ron, I want you to hold me accountable that Mr. Reven Fellows working with State Rep Ford and us, we're going to have a, a black agenda meeting that's going to be from the bottom up, not the top down. And we're going to keep moving directly with the National Block Club University, which is door by door, block by block, which I am an ambassador speaker for. And I will say this, another thing, another another problem, and I, I was, you know, you just said something that really, really stood out to me. You know, if you, if you, go, to the, if you go to the hospital, right, and you say, man, you know, I'm having some chest pains. Uh, you know, I, I need, I need, I need to see a doctor, right? Would you want somebody coming in there experimenting with you if you have some heart issues? 
No. I'm just, I'm, I'm I, I, look, right. I go to the doctor okay. all the time. I'm going to tell him to give me the little white pill, please. Okay, <laughs> Whether I need it or not. <laughs> Let's say you had to go have a prostate check, right? Oh, no. We ain't doing that one. You're going you gonna to let, you, you let somebody experiment in, in, in your special place? No, 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 no. So, so, then, so, then, so then we as black people in our community are way too comfortable letting people pontificate about the solutions to our social and economic ills. If we are in a space convening a conversation about economic development, economic empowerment, but the only people steering that conversation are preachers, pastors, and people who have no scientific background right. in that specific area, we have already set ourselves up to fail because we don't understand the importance of organizational uh, organizational behavior, budget and fiscal management, uh, all of these different tiers of economic development. I, like I, I went to Florida a and University on the highest of seven hills in Tallahassee, Florida, and majored in political science, but I, I, got, a, I got a concentration in urban development urban planning economic development not because somebody told me to do that but because my mother was a development when i was a young man i wanted to know why when i go to school in Hyde park it looked different than where i live at in north Pullman. why is it vacant lots over here and i don't see no vacant lots over here why is it abandoned buildings with hyperdermic needles on the ground in front of here but i don't see that over here what is the difference and nobody could give me an answer so i said i'm gonna go learn what the difference is and when i learned what the difference was it made me so mad i, I dropped out of school and I, I, I know, you know, I, I had everybody at home damn near put a hole in me when they found out I didn't drop that school and I had to finish up, you know, but I was pissed off. Like, no, no, you, you've been telling me lies all of this time. You know what I mean? So when I finally, you know, disciplined myself and finished up and came back here and went to graduate school with DePaul and all of that and got all of those, that, that technical skills that I needed, I realized that what was happening was we were addressing our problems the wrong way. Now it takes a collective body for me to be humble enough to sit at the feet of a Reven Fellows and say, look, tell me what you know, pour into me so that I can add that empirical information onto this stuff that I've learned conceptually and then mesh it together now that we are win together. Because what we're building, what we're doing as a people has to be bigger than us as an individual. But the, but the, but the characteristics, the character traits of most of our activists, uh, our, our, our you know, elected officials and pastors is that it's about me. I did this. I want to do this. Therefore, they don't understand the importance of delegating these things around. So you get a budget of money, but you don't understand budget and fiscal management. Right. So you get a two, three million dollar budget, but you don't know how to allocate it to the point where that turns into 20, 30 million. Mm -hmm. You just you spent it up on you spent it up on social programs. Mm -hmm. We we got we got 101 stop the violence campaigns. How many economic development campaigns do we have? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we we have we have a real problem that's internal. But it can be fixed though. You know, we, we, I mean, you know, we, we anytime we in it, we win it. That's historically who we are as a people. When Queen yeah. Nzinga saw that them brothers were scared to fight against them Portuguese, what she do? She dressed up like a man and went to war and won. You hear me? Yeah. When them Haitians said they want their freedom, what they do? They went to war and they won. Yeah. So that's what we do as people. When we in it, we win it. Now I gotta say this about uh, Reven Fellows. You know, he's been my brother for a long time. So we clicked immediately when we met. And uh, we were having a conversation a couple of days ago when I invited him on the show again um, that he is one of the brothers that's in the community that's been on the ground and he's underappreciated. And a lot of times people don't even know that he's on the front line fighting for their well-being and have been fighting. And people don't show him the love and respect that they should. I mean, he has got on the front line and gone out and done things for people and got things accomplished for people. And this, and they turn right around, and look at him, say, "We don't need you no more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, job well done. We even see you next time. We need you." And that, to me, has been irritating and aggravating because you're not gonna find another brother that's more truer to the cross than he is. You know, this guy will go out there, and I don't care who you name, African. Hispanic, black, they all know who he is. You know, when you say, hey, you need a busload of folks to go down to Springfield, he one of the first people they call. How many buses you need? Three, four, and they all go down there because they know we're even gonna give them bologna sandwiches and orange juice and, they, <laughs> and get them to Springfield and bring them back safely, okay? You know, he ain't gonna serve them no pork, he gonna give them beef bologna, but... <laughs> 
but but I'm making I'm making a joke out of it. But it's it's it, and that's a reality that I've known about him since I've been knowing him. You know, and and um, I mean, people just do not give him the respect that he deserves. And 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 I mean by that is, you know, you know, give him a Holy Ghost handshake every now and then. Slide a couple of grand in his pocket. He got bills to pay. You know, make him know that you appreciate what he's doing. You know, and, and I applaud him, and I never will get tired of applauding him. Every time I get an event going on, first thing I do, I say, what you doing, bro? Come on by. I got you. Am yes, I lying? Yes, sir. You know? Yes, and, sir. And then we get together, and we get to plotting, and then we'll talk about everybody, call him a whole sack of dirty names, you know? <laughs> And then, and then we wait for the next fool to come along to talk about. But the point that I'm making is, you know, there's folks in this town that don't know how to tap into the grassroots that's been here for a long. I've been in Chicago, you know, a long time myself, you know, and I got yes, stories sir. and I told him, he's like, damn, you was there? Yes, I was, you know, because I was in, I've been in the fight all my life too. Yes, sir. You know, and it ain't no joke, man. Look, they tried to kill me on more than one occasion, you know. And if I sit still long enough, they'll probably still. If they find out where I'm broadcasting from, they might kick my dough in, you know. But the bottom well, you line do, is... You, you, you always speak what's on your mind too much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bro, I got to keep it real, man. You know, I can't I can't play at this thing. You know, look, before we go any further, let me do this, because I know y'all got a rebuttal to that. I want to give a shout-out to some of the folks that's, that's watching the show and the broadcast right now. Uh, uh, Ed, uh, Chris Bates, my brother in broadcasting. Um, we got uh, 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 Deshaun. We got Lens of Faith. She's listening. Uh, Tammy Minor, Toretta Thomas, uh, Denise, David Webb, former mayor of Markham. I mean, we got people that are chiming in. You know, that you and I both know that are sticking out. Tony, That's my mentor, you know, uh, uh, Alicia, Alicia Remsen, uh, Rodney Brown. I mean, we got a lot of folks that are chiming in on the broadcast today. I always like to give them a shout out, you know, just to say hello to them and appreciate them. Uh, like and share the show, you all. Uh, I know we got about another uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, I want to talk about now the event that you have coming up with the museum because Reva mentioned it before we went live uh he was talking about your uh events you got coming up the pullman porter museum you know absolutely now let absolutely. me say this let me because some folks don't know what pullman porters were okay <laughs> let me just start out by yes, saying sir. this okay pullman porters were the brothers that served all the participants on the train they travel all across before airplanes, you know, right after stage coaches, <laughs> you know, they had trains that was the method of transportation from one end of this country to the other. And the brothers that were on the train, and I say brothers because I don't know of any white folks that co uh, that confess during that time to being a Pullman Porter unless they was half breeds, and y'all know what a half breed is. But these <laughs> brothers served you know everybody that traveled on the Amtrak I don't even know if it was still called Amtrak back then but that type of train commuter trains from from city to city coast to coast north to south they were on the trains and these brothers organized at one time to be able to be a union okay and they and they went on strike and they and they were accepted as brothers because they couldn't do it the job without them they didn't have nobody that can fill their spot they didn't, couldn't nobody cross the line to go in these spots these brothers organized and was able to come up with the Pullman Porters organization and they are very much part of our history because I think they made a movie uh all the brothers was named what John or something what was it 10,000 black men named George George that's named, right uh, Robert Townsend who's actually a descendant of a former reporter himself that's right every family that is successful yes. has had a history affiliated with somebody that worked in a position of servitude whether they from the south whether they from the north most of them gravitated to the north out of New York Chicago out of the uh, all of the uh, locations in the northern region 
because they had enough money to be able to do so. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when President Obama, one of the last things he did before he left office, he declared the Pullman area a historical site where they established the Pullman Porter Museum because the uh, place where they made the trains was in that area. I used to work for, for the company that used to make the trains. Y'all didn't know that. See, I know that. See, um, <laughs> it didn't last long. They got rid of me. You know, but <laughs> but but at that time when he did that, it opened the way for a national museum to be on the south side of Chicago, the Pullman area, you know, to be able to pay tribute to all of our ancestors that worked in this. So now now you can explain to them. Yeah, yeah, and I I'm I'm gonna go backwards just so I can make sure we, we touch everything up. Um so the museum was founded in February 25th, 1995 by Dr. Lynn Hughes. Uh, so we're actually, the event that we're having is our 25th anniversary, our annual Gentle Warrior Awards uh, Gala. So what happened was we've been in the Pullman district since before North Pullman was even considered a part of Pullman. You know, there were a, a collective of people that didn't want that portion, 96% black, you know, um, very low income, very low income people there. They didn't want that to be a part of it. They thought it was a blemish on the history. Dr. Hughes from 91 to 95 as a historic preservationist and developer fought in order to get them to recognize that. So the U.S. Department of Interior came in and designated from 103rd, 115th Street, Cottage Grove to the Expressway as what we call Pullman Historic District. Obama came in in 2015 and signed an executive order to declare that entire area as a national monument under the National Park Service site uh, uh, inventory. However, he did not mention the museum by name. He did not visit the museum. He did not acknowledge that the museum was there, even though in his speech, of which he got some of the content from our director because he, uh, he contacted Asala, of which he had been awarded a couple of years before, and they contacted her and said, we need content for his speech. She gave him the speech, and it sounded like he was one of our docents when he was up there giving it, but still would not give credit to us. I asked him for a picture. He said, I don't have time to do it. If I take a picture with you, I had to take it with everybody else. Dr. Hughes saw him behind the stage and said, you know, we really want to talk to you about getting our, our site named in this legislation specifically. He said, well, you know, we, we can't do that because if we do that, there's going to have to be a lot of unwriting. But every other one of the sites that are white in the district were mentioned. So we're the only site that wasn't mentioned, but we're the only site that represents black labor history. As a matter of fact, the National A. Philip Randolph Former Porter Museum is the first and only black labor history museum in the world that exclusively tells, preserves, and interprets the history of America's first and only black labor union. So that's one of those things where I'm talking about parties and just because they your skin folk don't mean that you can folk type of deal. You know what I mean? I, I was always very, very quiet about it. I was always very, very passive about it. But, you know, the more I hear about it and the more the struggles come as people are trying to appropriate our story and our history, heritage, and culture, it really, really gets my blood boiling. You know, I, I, I try my best. Ho to hold on one second. This is what I need you to do. Turn on your lights in the car so I can see y'all. Y'all getting dark. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Because you know y'all some dark-skinned brothers, okay? You yeah, know, yeah. there we go. But you know, you know, we, we like I say, we're, we're very proud to be, um, once again, America's first and only black labor history museum, not grant-dependent or funded by city, state, or federal funds. Say it one more time. Not what? We're not grant-dependent or, or, or funded. Our operations are not funded by city, state, or federal funds. Now, we do have a programmatic arm from time to time that can pull stuff in. But operationally wise or line item wise, which other, all the rest of the museums in the state of Illinois get, we do not get that because we have not had the blessing, if you will, to be considered a public museum. Although everybody, about 80% of our visitorship is not even black. And that's one, that's, that's another slap in the face because it's our people who don't come and support. It's people who come, who can barely speak English and they come through those doors and I say, well, how did you even hear about it? Oh, we read about you online. Oh, we knew all about you. We now, now, now let me ask you a question before you move from that point. Okay. Now, are you being marketed in our communities Listen. for people Listen. to Listen. know Listen. about you? Listen. 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 All, 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 I, all I can say to that. All, oh, let me get the camera back on. Oh, okay. Okay. There we go. All I can say to that is just go to Google right now. Anybody in watch, just go to Google right now and type in Pullman Porter Museum right now. And we beating that, we beating the internet up. You hear me? Okay. Everywhere. We, 
two, five, we were on Good Morning America. I sat on the stage with Prince Harry. You hear me, Prince Harry at the Obama sent at the Obama summit, and spoke about the museum. We just had we just had channel. Uh, we got a campaign on Channel Five right now. We've had two five seven nine, WTTW, any any outlet that you can think. Of. I've had Revolt TV, Sean Puppy, Cobbs News Network come on. Any network that you can think of, we've been on. Brother David, at least share with them the rep, the newest revelation of Reverend Jesse Jackson, the museum and, concept. And so 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 now what we're doing is you know. We don't we don't give we don't give our our, our living legends uh, their flowers while they're here. So whatever whatever differences we might have with any of these elected officials, we have to we have to honor the fact that they had put boots on the ground to do something for our people. And because that's the case, we're 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 on we're doing a museum expansion plan now. And with that expansion plan, we're gonna have a Jesse Jackson civil rights wing on that new piece. You know what I mean? Because of, he's one of the only living people that had an opportunity to even interact with a Philip Randolph. So we want to make sure that we archive that and then create a, a, a mechanism where we can really, really go into civil rights and what that really looks like. Because for all practical purposes, these are the brothers that crafted the civil rights movement because they were talking about economic equity way before even people were talking about civil rights. It was in 1925, August 25th, August 28th, 1925 at the Elks Lodge in Harlem, New York, that 500 porters from Chicago took a train down there to New York and Harlem and secretly met where they elected A. Philip Randolph as their president and they formed the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters on that night. It took them 12 years, you hear me? 12 years, 1937, when they received their charter on the American Federation of Labor. So these gentlemen, they, they did, so after they received that charter, that's when they knew they had the power to go to war. That's when they went and got that executive order signed in 1941. Then after that, when they saw they had that type of power, when Rosa Parks, who was E.D. Nixon's secretary, who was a poor reporter himself, who was the local representative of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and the local president of the NAACP, she was his secretary. When she got arrested, she called him. E.D. called his boss, A. Philip Randolph. Randolph gave him a list of businesses. They raised $92,000. $92,000 off a phone bank, and that's how they bailed out of jail and, and, and funded the bus boycott. Every last pastor in the city of Montgomery was scared to go to war, except for 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr. And that's when they grabbed him up and that's when they began to mentor him to be into his position. So that's why in 63, when A. Philip Randolph was slated to be the keynote speaker, he said no. In his infinite wisdom, he said no. He did he did a Reba Fellows. He said no, I'm going to put my mentees up here. I'm going to pour into the next generation. Young blood, you get up there and get a speech. And that's why we have, uh, I have a dream. That's right. That's why we had that because all of the elders surrounding him knew that he was the one at that very moment to deliver that message that would be timeless, you know. So I say all that to say as we're on the cusp of celebrating our 25th anniversary, as we're on the cusp of, of launching our collective uh, uh, initiative with what we call Randolph's Dream Community Development Corporation, we've collaborated with the CDC that we've created to create what we call the Community Economic Development Empowerment Project. It was called the Community Economic Development Power Project, but my mentor in his infinite wisdom knew that empowerment was what we needed. And he knew that wording was everything. So Reba Fellows told me that, no, you need to change that to empowerment. So now it's called the Community Economic Development Empowerment Project, CDEP 2020. What that is is a neighborhood stabilization plan that is nothing like we have seen before because it comes from not only empirical data and boots on the ground infinite wisdom, but it comes from documented economic development styles used across the country all the way back to the beginning of the time. And we combine all of these different techniques together and we're about to take our communities back. We're not asking anymore. We're, we're taking our community back and we're going to use the person in office in order to do it. All right now. Look, let me give a shout out to Brother Mark Allen, another brother in broadcasting. Hey, uh, now, hey, now, good, uh, yeah, he said, he said checking in from the National Black Wall Street, Chicago. Right, you know? right. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, dear friend of the museum, dear friend of our founder, Dr. Lynn Hughes, you know, we, we appreciate that brother and all the good work that he does. Uh -huh. uh, and as you are, Dr. Rod, he's one of my mentors. Yeah, also. yeah, yeah. Mark's a cool brother. Look, I, I, I catch his show every now and then, you know, uh, when he's on social media. He's, he's on every day. You know, I'm only on one day a week right now. I'm getting ready to change that. I think about going to two days a week. Um, but, you know, uh, people, you know, uh, uh, we have to feed the people, you know. Yes, and, yes. And, and as Reven knows, um, I had a, a radio show over 10 years ago before Internet radio was even popular. 
Not everybody yes, got sir. one. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I was bringing people and doing internet radio, man, and they were talking about yes, this will never work. You know, and now you know everybody's doing what I'm doing and and some. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing this Facebook Live thing, and I appreciate you brothers taking time out of your busy schedule, you know, to come together. And I got to thank you, an extra special, David, for helping Reba, because he's technically challenged, you know. <laughs> you know. That's, what, that's, what the young, that's what the young generation is for. You know, the soldiers, we're the, we the soldiers. We're here for the war, and the elders are here for counsel. Yeah, you so, know. So, so, so just as I'm standing before you, we're not letting another generation of our leaders die without the proper just do. We're yeah. going to get to the money right now, and we're going to pass it on up. And there you go. So that they can, they can understand what Yeah, they, they look, appreciate. look, look. I, I called him five times a day, man. You ready yet? You ready yet? You know, <laughs> and look, and he's like, no, I ain't ready yet. He ain't here yet. <laughs> you, well, know. you know, Ryan, I want to say this, man. Yes, sir. And man, you've been a truthful man in, in the media area. And, you know, there's no way I, everywhere I go, they do know you. You sit back, you don't say nothing. But when you say something, you, you, you kind of make them bleed a little bit sometimes. But they understand. <laughs> but I want to say uh, real quick, you mentioned about me taking bus loads. So I've been blessed. It's interesting that you say that in the spirit. So the West Side Justice Coalition Center on the West Side, tomorrow we're going to Springfield to the governor's announcement about the budget. And we're taking five or six organizations. As you know, they, I got the call. And I'm taking the south side to the west side. We're going to pack the bus up about 50 deep. And we're going down. The state rep is going to have, who's a great supporter of the A. Philip Randolph Museum. And Rep. Ford is a five beta sigma. Reba Fellows is a five beta sigma. And Asia Philip Randolph is a five beta sigma. But with that being said, Rep. Ford is going to announce tomorrow about teaching black history in the schools, elementary school. And then he's out at one o'clock. He's going to be talking about recognizing a Philip, the national a Philip Randolph legacy and the museum. So we're going to be going down there and listen to the governor and tell him, hey, we need our do. We need our share. So thank you so much, Doc. Well, you know, I, I can't let y'all get away. I got one more serious question because, you know, I can tell jokes and, and, and uh, try and lighten the blow a little bit, you know, with information. Because sometimes people, they have gold nuggets sitting in front of them. And they don't even understand what they're looking at or listening to. So sometimes you got to make them laugh so it'll, so it'll sink in. They'll, 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 they'll call me up tomorrow. No, nah, I got it. Um, but yeah. one thing that I think is, is, is near and dear to me, and I know it's near and dear to both of you all as well, but just um, what do we do today to make sure that uh, we stop saying Black History Month and continue to to celebrate us as black history 365 days out the year because i think that is something that we, we needs stop, to be addressed for permission we stop asking for permission you know what i mean we we, we don't want to sit at a lunch table where they're going to spit in our food we're going to go build our own mm -hmm. so with that being the case black history is every single day of the year so every time that we do something that's historic that's black history every time every time we're in a position where you know what I mean? We have an opportunity to speak our voice. That's black history. Every time we have an opportunity to uplift one of our living legends or one of our elders or one of our ancestors, that's black history. So we got to stop asking people for permission to be who we are put here to be. You know what I mean? There, there wasn't, there wasn't a, no, no liberal arts before it was taught in Wase, which was now, which is now my lead in Africa. We already was teaching the seven liberal arts before people even over here even knew how to wash and bathe themselves. You hear me? We brought these people out of the dark ages. We have to we have to own our history. We have to benefit from our history and we have to do it unapologetically. So we can't allow our history to be wrapped up in an all lives matter conversation and a minority conversation and a people of color conversation. Jeez. Because while we love all of those people, listen, I got I got a Jewish great grandfather and my granddaddy was an illegal immigrant over here from Cuba. You hear me? But, but, but when you when you look at me, what you see, you see a black man. That's it. So I, I love all my people. I love all my people, but I am unapologetically me, and I got to stand up for me and mine first and foremost so that when I come to the potluck, I got my own dish to bring. I don't want to be the person who comes to the potluck and bring the paper plates and the plastic spoons. I want to bring a dish. So we got to own our history. But to add to that, Brother Ron, 
uh, that policy thing is so important. So Rep. Ford recognizing that the black history being taught at the university this past summer, now I'm talking about mandatory in the elementary area, but then also doing an audit on why black history is not taught throughout the state of Illinois 1991 law that is a law. So what we're going to do is uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about that and dealing with policy because the, the black history bill that Dr. Barbara, ben, Dr. Bur Barbara Bird Bennett put together, whether people like or not, she put together a curriculum that's come not, not in African slavery, but in Egypt and bring us to now where we are. So Black History 365 is a law to teach black history in the state of Illinois, not just 28 days. It's ongoing, and she put that curriculum together, which is not being used. We're going to address it. So that's the way, because you can't talk about America history without talking about black history yeah. so we started the conversation and mama d who's one of our montessori teachers she just filed a bill with state rep ford to make sure we put our colors on the calendar like they do on irish they make everybody the school wear green we're gonna have our colors our red black and green we're gonna have designated days throughout the year where we stop the school and we wear some black power yeah. all right look i got a comment i gotta read off the air uh read on the air uh, uh, the, the, the Tika Rose, uh, she made a comment. We are still organizing tipped workers' wages for tipped workers is $2.13 on a federal level. Since Philip A. Randolph and now Illinois wage, wages for tipped wages are 5.55, we need one fair wage. So she's making a point that, uh, you know, the wages for being tipped in, in Illinois is still below poverty level. You know, you can't survive off no 555, mm -hmm. you know, so it's so much more work that needs to be done, you know, um, you know, and, and, and that's just one of the comments that happened to come in on the, on the Facebook feed. Look, we got to get out of here, fellas. You all going to come back and see me again? She represents, that's, that's their champion, the rock group that's doing it. So we're looking forward to working with them with the museum because it lies in that, it'll connect the history. But uh, they, the rock group are doing a whole lot of work around that. Hey, Queen, thank you for checking in with us. Just come visit us, PullmanPorterMuseum.com, and let's continue. Can David visit. tell the day of the anniversary of uh, the Sat event? Saturday, February 22nd at the Parkway Ballroom, 5 to 9. PullmanPorterMuseum.com for all information. PullmanPorterMuseum.com. All right. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Have a blessed week. Yeah, look, we got uh, Reaving Fellows at Yahoo.com. You can email him. His phone number is right on the screen, 773-969-9644. Now, I'm sure David going to show him how to answer his phone when it starts ringing. So don't, <laughs> he, might, he might answer it, okay? And you're going to have to show him how to answer it again, bro, because I know he didn't forget. But uh, look, are you all gonna come? You all gonna come and see me again? Absolutely. Oh yeah, I gotta address that NBA All Star game I couldn't do, and that's hot and heavy. I'm gonna cut him up and make him feel real, real low because we let a half a billion dollars come here, and everybody from McCormick Place 22nd all the way to United Center, then nobody West Side past Western make a dime. Nobody past 22nd Street coming to the Wild Hundred make a dime is a damn crying shame. And we'll talk about it in a later date. But black folk got to be out there rabbit mind. All right. right. I, I like that. You know, I ain't scared to talk about it. You know I'm not. <laughs> look, uh, look, we're going we gonna to try and, 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 and try and make this happen at least once a month. Please like and share. Spread this information. This is very powerful information that we need to spread around. Like and share. If you want to go over to my website, ask-dr-rn.com, uh, please send me your information. Uh, please let me know if you want to be an advertiser. I uh, appreciate you. you. You have plenty of other things to do, but you came here to hang out with us, and I do not take that lightly. I appreciate y'all. So uh, peace and love. See y'all next week.